Last lecture, we introduced oligopolies, in which a few firms dominate the market and new firms face large barriers to entering that market. Unlike under perfect competition, in oligopolies, firms have some power to set the prices for their goods. But unlike for monopolies, for oligopolistic firms, this power isn't absolute, since there are few other firms in the market. We can think of oligopolistic firms engaged in a kind of game. We'll analyze these types of situations using the tools of game theory. Think about the last competitive game you played. What are the key things you need to know how to play this game successfully? First, you'd want to know what determines when the game is over. Second, you'd want to know what is the best strategy for winning. The game that firms are playing in an oligopoly is determining the outcome in a market. The game is over when the market is in equilibrium, when all participants are satisfied with the outcome and have no incentive to change their quantities or prices. So what is the firm's best strategy for setting quantity and price? Well, that depends on what it thinks other firms in the market are doing. In game theory, we typically express this in terms laid out by the Nobel Prize winning economist and mathematician John Nash, the subject of the book and movie A Beautiful Mind. Nash posited that the game was over and the market was in equilibrium when no firm wants to change its strategy given what other firms are doing. That is, Holding all of the firm's strategies constant, no firm could obtain a higher profit by changing its strategy. This might sound pretty confusing. So let's start by looking at one of the classic games in game theory, the prisoner's dilemma. The story goes the two bad guys are caught for a crime and the police put them in separate rooms to interrogate them. Each bad guy is told that just based on the scene alone, there's enough evidence to send the two of them to prison for one year. But they're also told that if one of them testifies against the other, the one who testifies gets to go free and the other one gets five years in prison. If they both testify that it's the other one's fault, they both go to prison for two years. We can model this by writing down a payoff matrix, which shows the implications for both players under each decision they make. If both prisoners A and B stay silent, they each get a year in prison. If A testifies but B stays silent, a goes free, that's zero years in prison, and B gets five years. On the other hand, if B testifies but A stays silent, then B goes free and A gets five years. And if they both testify on each other, they each get two years. So what's the best strategy for each player in this high stakes game? In part, that depends on what we talked about last lecture, whether the players are cooperative or non-cooperative. If they're cooperative, both prisoners should stay quiet and each take the year in prison. But what's more realistic, given they can't talk to each other, is the non-cooperative situation, which plays out very differently. Imagine that you're prisoner A. If your buddy prisoner B stays silent, you're better off testifying, giving up your friend, since that would mean you go free instead of having to spend a year in prison. And if prisoner B betrays you and testifies, you're still better off testifying, so that would mean you get only two years in prison instead of five. For prisoner A, testifying is a dominant strategy. It's the best strategy no matter what the other player does. That is, if prisoner B testifies, A is better off if he testifies. And if prisoner B doesn't testify, A is also better off testifying. No matter what B does, A is better off testifying. And that what's, that's what makes testifying a dominant strategy for prisoner A. Prisoner B faced the same situation. For prisoner B, testifying is also a dominant strategy. If prisoner A testifies, B is better off if he testifies. And if prisoner A doesn't testify, B is also better off testifying. No matter what A does, B is better off testifying. That's what makes testifying a dominant strategy for prisoner B. So the game ends up with both prisoners testifying and both spend two years in prison. This is the Nash equilibrium because both prisoners are choosing the best strategy given what the other prisoner is doing. Therefore, we're in equilibrium. Neither prisoner wants to change their action given the action of the other prisoner. If only both prisoners could have stayed silent, they could have reduced their prison sentences to a year. Alas, they couldn't coordinate. Each shows the dominant strategy that was best no matter what the other prisoner chose. Now they're both worse off. This is the prisoner's dilemma. The key to analyzing these types of problems is to look for dominant strategies for each player and then find the point where these dominant strategies intersect. This is a Nash equilibrium. 
A classic real world example is in advertising. Think about Coke and Pepsi, two big competitors with name recognition who largely control the market for soda. These two firms would be better off if neither of them advertised and they simply split the market. Advertising is expensive, and each firm would rather pocket that extra profit rather than spend it on TV commercials and billboards. But this is not the equilibrium for the market. If no one's currently advertising, Coke knows that if it advertises, it can steal a large portion of Pepsi's market share. And even if, even if Pepsi is currently advertising, Coke knows that it better advertise as well. Otherwise, well, Pepsi will steal a large portion of Coke's market share. So the dominant strategy is to advertise. Suppose we have the following payoff matrix. Without advertising, Coke and Pepsi split the market and each make eight units of revenue from their sales. Let's say advertising costs a firm five units. If both firms advertise, they still split the market, but they each have to pay five units for their ads. So both firms end up with a payoff of three. If only one firm advertises, then let's say it gets the whole market. So if Pepsi advertises and Coke doesn't, Pepsi gets the entire payoff of 16 from the market, minus the five for the ads for a total of 11, and Coke gets nothing. Same idea if Coke advertises, but not Pepsi. Coke will get 11, and Pepsi will get nothing. Clearly, both Coke and Pepsi would prefer to be here, where neither advertise and each gets a payoff of eight. This would be the best cooperative strategy. But if they can't cooperate, each has a dominant strategy to advertise, forcing them to an equilibrium where each gets a payoff of only three. A key feature of non-cooperative equilibria is the race to the bottom. Both Coke and Pepsi are worse off if they don't cooperate than if they could. One way to stop this race is for Coke and Pepsi to cooperate, with each agreeing not to advertise. So why don't they do this? For two reasons. The first is what we discussed last time. It's hard to enforce cooperation. Once this agreement's in place, both Coke and Pepsi have an incentive to cheat and advertise. Since the other one thinks the deal is still in place, Coke and Pepsi could advertise and grab the whole market. Both firms know this, so they end up unable to cooperate. Second, this type of cooperation between firms and a market is illegal in much of the world, including the US. Most countries have antitrust laws, which ban this type of cooperative behavior because it's viewed as anti-competitive and bad for consumers. This is another reason why we're not gonna see any soda cartels in the US anytime soon.